Hi, and welcome to another Entrepreneur Stories. I'm Afonso from Bundle, but you know what this is about. It's not about me, and it's not about Bundle. This is about finding those entrepreneurs. It's about finding the people who have made businesses within businesses, people who understand what it takes, and who, at times, have gone against the grain, but have amazing insights on the challenges that they faced and how they made it, or not. But this is where we are to learn. I'm very excited today because I have with me Paul Ellingstad. I'm delighted to speak to Paul because his enthusiasm for entrepreneurship is second to none. And he actually has a lot of roles in mentorship of entrepreneurship today um, uh, through uh, the Aspen Institute and as managing director of PTI Advisors. But at his time at HP, Paul built an entrepreneurship story or a venture, which is what we're looking for, that actually started from perhaps the social entrepreneurship side and moved on to the commercial business arm side. However, that's not a story for me to tell. It's actually for Paul to tell us. So welcome, Paul. Good morning. Great. Thank you, Alfonso. Uh, it's great to have you here. You're calling in from West Ireland, if I'm correct. I am indeed. Uh, that's great. I mean, it seems very sunny for West Ireland, so uh, it is also here. So I think we're all in, uh, in sync, which is great. Paul, we had an amazing conversation the other day, and you were telling me about your adventure. Um, I thought it was great. The visual survey platform is what we're going to be talking about. But where were you? How did you get involved? And who are the parties involved in building this venture? Well, venture and adventure, I think, are really good terms <laughs> to describe the uh, the journey that I've been on. Uh, so I'll just rewind a little bit just to give the uh, you know the backdrop to this. I'll take us back to the summer of 2009. So got a call from a close colleague. Our, our board had met and was really unhappy with the direction that the company was going in terms of corporate social responsibility. The CEO at the time had turned the company around financially. But through that turnaround process, there was a sense by the board that the company had lost its way in terms of global citizenship and social responsibility. A colleague that called, knowing that I was doing quite a bit of work with uh, foundations and in the community outside of work, I thought that I would be someone very interested in, in helping to look at this strategy and come up with a new plan. And long story short, we, we came up with, um, well, I should say we embraced the concept of social innovation. Uh, Michael Porter and Mike, Mark Kramer at the time were talking about uh, creating shared value, but it was really at that stage just a theory rather than something that you could point to and say, oh yeah, here are a lot of uh, case studies of how successful it has been. Uh, our board really embraced this as a strategy and off we go to the races of, of seeing if this is more than a theory, that if, if a company like HP with almost 300,000 employees could pivot from simply giving money and donating computers to having a very active innovation model that also supported the business as well as society. Through that, uh, I set up a partnership uh, with John Elkington and his uh, uh, new consulting firm, Volans uh, Ventures. And, you know, Volans had suggested to us that, you know, a really good way to really start to embrace social innovation was through partnership. Through that, uh, we were introduced to the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship. And Martine Burt, the founder of Foundation Paraguay, was one of the Schwab uh, Foundation uh, fellows. And uh, Martine and I met uh, later on, uh, you know, that, uh, that year, end of 2009. Martine described to me what they had been doing, trying to eliminate poverty, and that they had many community workers that were collecting data, you know, meeting with families, understanding, you know, the dynamics of why they're in poverty, but doing all of this on paper. To me, through what started out as a conversation over coffee, that seemed like a very, very good fit of common, common purpose. Uh, for us as a big uh, technology company to come together with our expertise and help this very progressive uh, nonprofit that needed to use technology to really advance to, to, to achieve their mission. So here we are, you have yourself at HP and buy-in yep. from the board, uh, working in or taking over the capacity of how do we pivot the CSR innovation side of HP. Yep. You have a foundation, Foundation Paraguay, that came from um, Volans Ventures and Schwab. Yep. And you were going to help 
a foundation survey poverty with HP technology. That was your lay of the land from the get-go. Did you know what you were going to build? Didn't know exactly what we were going to build, but in looking at how pervasive technology has become, and even back in 2009, I can't believe it's like in the eight, nine years ago now, um, everyone was talking about apps. Oh, we have an app for this, we have an app for that. Virtually everything that we were starting to do, all of a sudden we were coming into this age of mobility. So when, when Martine described how the community workers were going and sitting down with families and going through sort of a data collection process to understand why the families are in poverty, I looked at this and said, oh my, oh my goodness, you know, that's, these are the exact same types of workflows or processes of collecting data, being able to analyze it you know, right on the dot, but then also to aggregate it and do that analysis. All of this just seemed like you know, this, is a, this is almost like a cut and paste of how we use technology in so many different processes. So I had the fundamentals of how we could apply technology. But the other big thing that I think um, I, I always stop and really, really counsel people when I'm advising around, uh, around innovation and, uh, and problem solving, you know, as the saying goes, fall in love with the problem, not with the solution. This wasn't about simply saying, oh yeah, we can build an app, you know, that's no problem, just, you know, and we'll give you the, the smartphones or the technology. You really have to, you know, peel back the onion and understand the problem in the context instead of just leaping into a solution and then missing that context and not having an effective, sustainable solution over time. So I knew that we could be helpful, but I knew that we were gonna have to roll up the sleeves and really get to understand what was happening in terms of poverty, how were the community workers interacting with the families that were in poverty, and how were they working in the community? That was more important than saying, yeah, we, we can build an app or a platform or give you some technology to make this workflow easier. And, and, and in doing so, Paul, it seems to me that you enter then what is a team building exercise for ideation and validation to understand what are we going to do according to how people use and survey poverty according to the standards of Foundation Paraguay. Um, yep. How did you first, did you have hand raisers to join your team or how did you persuade people to join your cause and what sort of ideation process validation did you go through, if you remember? It, it, it's not quite a paint by numbers, let me say it that way. Um, you know, one of, one of the uh, dilemmas I'd say is that you have everyone from the board and the CEO and you know executives to frontline solution developers, you know architects and engineers that sort of you know trust, but it's it's like that you know that Ronald Reagan saying trust but verified, you know they're saying well it sounds interesting we'll try it, so you have to be able to show results along the way. You know you can set out a big vision, but you've got to have milestones of progress and achievement along the way. And as we were going through that, I think that was the thing that actually had me most concerned was that we had to prove that this bigger vision, this bigger change that we were talking about was going to yield the type of results, not only in terms of social impact, you know, for the families in poverty, for Foundation Paraguay and how they were, you know, how they were running their organization to achieve their mission, but also in terms of demonstrating for HP, for the shareholders, for our clients, that we had a different way of working that was also good for the company and its mission rather than just doing the sort of transa transactional giving that might you know, generate a good press release. And so if I, if I understand you correctly, these, the milestones for you were not just to keep your stakeholders at ease of what you were developing, but also to maintain a team engaged. And it sounds That's to me your validation versus development was an iteration over time. Did you yep. have a clear calendar of milestones you had to achieve over a period of time? Was it a project that you laid out, okay, we're gonna do this change in the next six months, one year, 18 months? What, what were you looking at? Yeah, not, not to be flippant about this, but it's like the saying, you know, Norman Schwarzkopf, uh, the, you know, the famous um, US Army general saying, you know, best laid plans, you know, last until the first shots are fired on the battlefield. You have to be very agile, and I know that's one of these you know corporate buzzwords. You need to be flexible and adaptable. That you set out a vision, a strategy that underpins that, but you have to sort of read what's happening as you go along. 
you know, as an example with this, a uh, really interesting example, uh, we, we continued to go through a lot of significant organizational and leadership change at HP. And when we set out the strategy with the board, you know, we aligned our, our social mission, what we wanted to accomplish in terms of social impact, to the Millennium Development Goals, which have now you know, evolved into the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, that was all well and good. The board bought into it. Everyone understood that. But we also went through more financial pressures. After we had started our strategy, there was a, a strategic decision made by the CMO and his staff that we would only invest for the next year in five sort of existing mature markets, such as the US and the UK and France, and then in four of the, you know, the developing markets, as they were called, the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine, now we have the finance director saying, well, we're doing this partnership with who? Paraguay? Where is that even on the map? Oh, is that in, in Latin America? Who, you know, who, who is this? You can't do that anymore because it's not one of our top countries for investment. And so that was, that was you know, a huge blow, could have shut things down right away. I wound up having to go through a very, uh, let's just call it a sensitive process of justifying that even though our core partner was, was physically or legally registered in Paraguay, this was a program that was addressing poverty in every single country. Every single one of the countries that was on our investment list for marketing could ultimately benefit if we developed this solution. Actually, you know, in, in hindsight now, uh, there were times that I probably, you know, stepped over the line, could have been fired for, you know, continuing some of the development. But it was that belief that, I'm still meeting the, you know, the directive of where we're investing, even though in the most literal sense, someone could stop and look at that and say, oh, yeah, but you're investing in Paraguay. No, I'm not investing in Paraguay. We have a partner in Paraguay that's helping us do something globally. So that type of challenge you know, is, is uh, it, it, it goes beyond politics. <laughs> it goes beyond, you know, sort of the, the everyday justification of what you're doing and why. And how far along into the project were you when you had this challenge that came about with a change in budget allocation and priority allocation? And was that the longest hiccup in terms of, you know, the challenges you face as an entrepreneur? We, we were we were nine months into the process. So we had already sort of scoped out, we had understood the workflows, we had understood the context and, and had already, you know, developed sort of the, um, the minimum viable product. So we, we were started. If, if I had just simply done a compliance of, well, you know, the new directive, we can only, you know, in, in, uh, invest in these countries, you know, perfect letter of the law, yeah, let's let's just turn this off. I feel that we would have been one of these case studies that nonprofits would be using of saying, see, you can't really trust companies, mm -hmm. you know, their word doesn't last, they do one thing, the quarter changes, they make different investment priorities, and off they go in a different direction. So I was thinking of it very much not only in terms of, uh, of the personal and the organizational commitments that we had made to this partner, but also what was happening in terms of the broader market, and quite frankly, a real suspicion that nonprofits had of this new way of working that companies were saying that they wanted to do. I got you. So, so here we are, you, you, you have this main objective, right, where you're developing this solution for poverty around the world. You have a partnership. Yep. You've been on it for nine months. You've had this hiccup. You're back on track. When was it apparent to you that the solution you're coming up with was not just about social entrepreneurship, but had commercial viability for a future yeah. product offering of HP? So, so this is a really good question because I went into this really drinking the Kool-Aid, so to say, of you know this, this new model of addressing both commercial viability or, or, or sort of the financial and the business objectives of a company as well as the so societal impact. So rather than this, this sort of serial process of saying, well, we'll invest and we'll do something that's, uh, that's um, you know, socially impactful and then we'll try to make a business out of it, 
I went into this again, seeing that the, the, the workflow process in bringing technology into a workflow to improve the effectiveness as well as the efficiency of how you work and what you deliver, that was something that applied both commercially as well as uh, you know philanthropically. So when I went into it, I felt very confident from my experience working with the sales teams and directly with our customers and, and what they wanted from HP as a company that I said, if we, if we treat Foundation Paraguay and the visual survey platform as a new software solution, a new platform that we're developing, it doesn't matter if they're a nonprofit or if they're a, you know, a for-profit company or even how we invest to build that product in the first place, if we can show the viability of the solution, no different than, say, a company donating computers, we can either donate this solution or we can sell this solution. And what was really interesting is that the, the software development team that was working with me on the development, but then was also, as part of their other you know, day-to-day -day job, was developing new solutions um, you know, for, for banks and, and airlines and other paying customers, as they started to talk to some of these other commercial clients and share what they were doing, this new solution that they were developing, we had insurance companies that had, uh, you know, uh, financial adjusters or, or you know, uh, insurance adjusters out in the field. We had airlines, you know, with lost baggage. They were seeing the concept and saying, "Oh my God, can you take that and apply that and do this for our field agents, for you know, for our lost baggage handlers?" They saw the viability of the product and they were willing to pay straight up. So that was that was the penny dropping, not just for me, but for the for the the guys in the P and L that said this isn't about philanthropy versus you know running running a day-to-day -day business we're developing solutions and then we have different business models for how we offer that solution to paying or non-paying customers so you became from an idea to pivot your CSR objectives you became the poster child even for a whole new business software that you were able to that commercialize was, that that was it and the exciting bit was that it's not it's not one guy, it's not, oh, this team that was leading change that was on the poster. It was, it was you know, the solution and how HP as a company, you know, with its know-how of technology and workflow and problem solving and, dare I say, innovation, actually collaborated with customers. So instead of some of the, the lip service of, oh, we're an innovative company and, you know, we care about our customers and we collaborate with our customers, like this was walking walking the talk and our customers and the market could see it as opposed to us just you know saying it amazing and i've done a search online for the visual survey platform and i was able to see the way it works and uh, yes you can see all the applicabilities of it but i have a question that was left from yulia savitskaya um, head of customer success at solvi yep. but when she was um at a great place to work in the u.s and she built a um entrepreneurship arm of training um, middle to senior management. Uh, and she left a question for you, which is looking back at the visual survey platform project that pivoted CSR and became a business arm in terms of a software. What was one of the big decisions that changed everything? I mean, there's probably more than one. That's why I, she did ask for one, but I'm sure there's a lot of them. What was one of them that, you know, it changed everything? Uh, so this this is a great question. Uh, you know, ten gold stars to Yulia for <laughs> asking it as well. Um, you know, I, I thought about this, and it's um, you know everyone's always looking for the silver bullet. You know, what's in the secret sauce? Uh, it, it is really hard to pin down and say, oh, there's one thing. And it's you know it's usually more. I'd say the uh, you know the 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 analogy is the the pearl necklace. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a string of different things that happen. The, the, if I had to put it down to one, though, I would say this. Um, if you do any research, if you do any reading on, you know, the rock star, the legendary innovators and, and what sets them apart, you know, you'll hear one of the common themes in the stories is they had an idea and they, you know, they went and tried to pitch it to a VC or, you know, to their board or whoever. And oftentimes it's, oh, it's shot down. That's a stupid idea. Oh, it'll never fly. Oh, there's not a market for that. All of the naysayers of why this idea won't work. But it's the, it's the individuals that make the time that imagine the possibility or make room for the possibility and are willing to listen 
to the crazy people who come up with a crazy idea, you know, whether they're, you know, a mad inventor or, you know, they're a kid living in a slum who has an idea for making life better, you know, in, in her community. So I think the one thing that made the big difference is once I saw this, this idea coming, you know, first from Porter and Kramer, but from John, uh, John Elkington and his team of saying there's a different way of doing social impact. You can kill two birds with one stone, so to speak, you know, working in social impact, but still continuing to drive the business. Give it a try. And it's so from, from my own personal point of view as an intrapreneur, putting that label on, I think it's it's being open to the possibilities and then relentlessly pursuing them and, and, and trying to make them possible. From the flip side, though, I find now as well as an advisor and, and having a lot of people come to me with these mad ideas, absolutely make the time. Do not dismiss something as completely out of hand, no matter how crazy, no matter who's coming up with the idea. Imagine the possibilities and make time to explore them. You're obviously very passionate about entrepreneurship, Paul. And one thing I want to ask you is, where do you feel innovation and entrepreneurship are going today? I mean, you do mentorship, you're involved yep. in various projects. Um, I'm sure I'll hear about you involved in more projects in the future. <laughs> where do you think we're going today with entrepreneurship? I, I personally have troubles with some of the labels. And, and you know, every, every week, month, year, there's new labels, you know, Innovation has been hot in business, you know, since the dawn of time. It's, uh, you know, a CEO, a, a chief financial officer on their quarterly earnings, you know, will always talk about how innovative the company is and how that's going to drive growth and shareholder value and everything else. But, you know, getting beyond sort of the labels and the buzzwords, uh, life is becoming faster, more complex for all of the good things that that brings in terms of connecting us all over the world. Uh, but it's also bringing a lot of stress as well. You know, it's, it's absolutely information overload. So trying to keep up with everything that's going on and still be effective, you know, as, you know, as a professional, as an individual, with your family, with your friends, with your colleagues, you know, it's really, really tough. And what I, what I think in terms of entrepreneurship and innovation fundamentally what connects those is change it's about coping with not coping with change embracing change and thriving on change realizing that we can always make things better but innovation and entrepreneurship bring a little bit of the the process and the structure to do that to make all of this craziness that's going on around us a little bit easier to manage so i think the 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 big thing of where is entrepreneurship going? Where is innovation going? You know, it's recognizing these are tools, these, these are a mindset of how to embrace change and literally make life better for all of us. Thank you, Paul. And I got to ask you, I need you to leave me with a question so I can take along to my next interview. Absolutely. So thinking about this, and again, to this idea of labels, I'm... Um, I, I would be hard pressed to find anyone who would not want to be described as as uh, as innovative or as an innovator. And the same goes with uh, with entrepreneurship and intrapreneurship. It's uh, you know it's it's new cousin you know that's come onto the scene now. So you know a lot of times there's sort of the urban myth or there's you know the 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 awe and the legend around this concept of you know oh you're an entrepreneur or you're an intrapreneur isn't that cool? It also has sort of this mystique of you're you're a lone wolf, you're a lone ranger, you know, you're sort of the, you know, the guy on the white horse saving the day. But in reality, it's about inspiring others, you know, and getting others bought into this movement of of change, embracing change. So I'd I'd love to hear from you know some of the other entrepreneurs out there, you know, how do you put sort of the uh, the the ego and the you know, the personal contribution and the reward and the acknowledgement that you get from that, put that to the side. How do you, how do you drive the movement? How do you get uh, anyone to feel that they could be an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, a change maker that literally makes the world better and better, you know, not just for themselves or their close friends and colleagues, but everyone around them. Paul, fantastic. Thank you so much. If you can hold on for 30 seconds, 
Um, sure. I'm just going to say goodbye to the camera and thank you for all of these amazing uh, nuggets of wisdom of your entrepreneurship story. Thank you, Afonso. Um, well, thank you so much for being with us on Entrepreneur Stories. Paul shared a lot with us. He's left a great question that I want to see answered next time. But to the entrepreneurship story and the venture specific, Paul left something really key, which is fall in love with the problem, not the solution. Thank you so much for being with us and watching this. If you're not watching this, do bear in mind we have this on podcast form. You can uh, listen to this on any of your favorite platforms if you don't want to be seeing us on a Skype call between Antwerp and West Ireland. Um, second ask for me is leave questions below. Leave questions and we at Bundle, will, we will answer them. We will also share them with Paul if it's for Paul specific. So let us know what your questions are. Please participate. And my third ask, if you're an entrepreneur or know of an entrepreneur, please get in touch. My email will be below. Please let me know who you are. I'd love to talk to you, find out what was your adventure. Thank you, and we'll be back in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Afonso.